there you go. to get to what you came here tonight for, but um, I'm just really excited that um, Brett is here and that he's able to come and speak to us tonight. Um, you know, many people that are here to tonight know Fred <coughs> from back when he and his wife Melinda lived in Butte in the late, from the late 70s to the early 90s, and both of them made a huge impact on Butte. Um, but they've left, unfortunately, and Fred keeps coming back, which is really wonderful. He's a, <coughs> just a, he's a renowned academic historian, and he is here tonight to give a talk on his manuscript which is an adaptation of his PhD dissertation, which was on the, um, of the effects of mining and smelting operations in Butte and Anaconda, the effects on the environment and the super fun cleanup that followed. Um, Pat Knee, <laughs> environmental scientist here tonight who worked for the state for many years and helped with a lot of the cleanup, so he used Fred's PhD dissertation as a Bible to guide the cleanup efforts and that they've spent something like $50 million in it so far. So Fred has really contributed to the successful, one of the contributors to the highly successful Superfund project here in Butte. I just wanted to say personally it's really great for me to have Fred here because I fell in love the first time I met Butte. I mean I met Fred. I came here in June of 1985. Fred had um, hired me straight out of graduate school. I'd just gotten a degree in preservation. And he hired me, sight unseen, to come to Butte and work for RTI, the preservation firm that he had founded. And when I got here, my first evening, we went out to dinner with Fred and his lovely wife, Melinda. We went to Means. And after that, Fred and I spent, I don't know, it seemed like just a few minutes, but it was probably hours walking the streets of the uptown and talking about the buildings and the head frames and everything. Butte, I mean, Fred conveyed to me the wonderful history of Butte and its people. And I fell in love with Butte that night, and I've been in love with Butte ever since. And I really contributed that to Fred. Um, he was a wonderful mentor. He's a wonderful person all the way around. So. We're going to have a wonderful evening and enjoy his talk. Well, thanks, Mary. Oops, I don't have to talk so loud. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm used to talking loud when I'm in a room. Is this too loud? I, I'd be happy to turn this off. I can turn it. I can turn it down a little bit. Okay. No, I'll yeah. Turn it down. No. I just. Yeah. One click. It's my pattern to project my voice. <laughs> If I don't get to do that, I might get stage fright or something. Is that a little bit better? Let's, yeah, that's good. Moving. Okay, great. Okay. Well, can still here. Yes. And thank you for that, Mary. I know uh, I felt really uh, lucky when we hired you Sight Unseen, and one of the things that uh, um, I've always been fond about you is that you are as much in love with Butte as I am. In fact, probably more, because you stayed. <laughs> so kudos to you. At any rate, as Mary said, this is, uh, I wrote a PhD dissertation on this topic and uh, completed it in 1998 and have always wanted to revise it for uh, work uh, as a publishable book. And since that time, I've worked um, as an expert witness in Superfund litigation all over country uh, doing uh, comparable uh, 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 work to what I did here in Butte and Anaconda and um, uh, that has broadened my scope of uh, the, the, this industry that uh, uh, Butte and Anaconda have been a part of and so one of the big things that I've done in this manuscript is try to put um, uh, this Butte history in a much larger context um, which helps explain why this is the largest Superfund complex in the United States. And so that's what the book is about, and I'll be summarizing those ideas uh, here tonight. And the way I'd like to do that, as I've been researching uh, this material uh, since I wrote my dissertation, I've continued to dig into sources and have found lots of what I consider uh, wonderful quotes 
And so in my uh, manuscript, every chapter has an epigram, a little, uh, some are not so little, uh, but uh, an epigram that uh, launches the chapter. And so what I'd like to do uh, uh, tonight is provide the summary of the book by uh, reading each of those epigrams and then elaborating on a, a number of them uh, for some of the chapters. So uh, the first epigram, there's two epigrams that open the book. And the first one, uh, I think you might uh, consider uh, a bit unusual. It's these 12 verses from the book of Job. Those of you who are familiar with the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament know that uh, the book of Job is part of the wisdom literature, uh, a section of the Old Testament called the wisdom literature. And then uh, in the middle of that book are three chapters that really address directly uh, uh, this question of uh, what is wisdom. And the middle chapter of those three, uh, chapter 28, um, is about mining. And it puts, um, uh, and, and, and in many ways, this might be more for a, a non viewed audience. Uh, people in Butte know a lot about mining. But mining is a very peculiar thing that human beings do. Um, and so this conveys that um, in <coughs> ancient literature. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold to be refined. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper <coughs> is smelted from ore. Miners put an end to darkness and search out the farthest bound, the ore in gloom and deep darkness. They open shafts in a valley, away from human habitation. They are forgotten by travelers. They sway suspended, remote from people. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and its dust contains gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud wild animals have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. They put their hand to the flinty rock and overturn mountains by the roots. They cut out channels in the rocks, and their eyes see every precious thing. The sources of the rivers they probe, the hidden things they bring to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? So I think you can see in this piece of ancient literature that this conveyance of the idea that mining is not something that most people are associated with. It's an out-of-the-way activity that only some people participate in, and it has nothing to do with um, uh, living things, <laughs> not lions, uh, etc. Um, so the, the second epigram is shorter. Um, it's a quote from uh, a recent publication of Ed Dobb. Many of you probably remember Ed Dobb. He was born in Butte uh, after high school, moved away, came back uh, sometime in the mid-90s, um, lived in Walkerville for a, a number of years, wrote that marvelous essay in Harper's Magazine uh, in 1996 called Pennies from Hell, which is about um, you know, the, the way the rest of the United States and the world depends on copper from places like Butte. Um, and few people are aware of the uh, environmental devastation that mining has wrought. And so this epigram I'll be reading is from, uh, how many of you are aware of this uh, series of art exhibitions, uh, Extraction, just out of curiosity? Few hands. Ed and a printer who uh, was born and raised in Missoula but has a, a fine art printing business in Berkeley, California. The two of them uh, had this idea, inspired by the Berkeley pit, to have to mount a series of s several dozen uh, art exhibitions around the country of uh, depictions that artists have uh, uh, made of uh, extractive industries, especially mining. And this is the cover of the uh, catalog of that series of exhibitions. 
and lots of stuff. There's one section with um, these uh, paintings and some others by Monty Dolak. Uh, most everyone uh, in this room is probably familiar with Monty Dolak's uh, work. And some of it is photography. This is a photograph of uh, Newmont Mining Company's Carlin Mine in uh, Nevada. Um, uh, it uh, went into um, operation in the mid-60s. It's still operating. It's a huge open pit now. Um, and so this is from the introduction. Ed Dodd, as most of you know, died um, in uh, 2019. So he died before uh, uh, this uh, series of exhibitions uh, came to fruition. But he wrote the introduction. And so it's part of that catalog. And this is just uh, two little sections from that butte. One of the world's richest copper producing centers with around 22 billion pounds of extracted copper already removed and more on the way. Today, after 140 years of relentless industrialized mining, Butte is also the uppermost part of the largest Superfund complex in the United States, a place of staggering environmental ruin. Like Concord, Gettysburg, and Wounded Knee, Butte is one of the places America came from, and it is where we must return in the manner of a pilgrimage if we wish to grasp in full the implications of our appetite for metals. And so this really gets at what I want to accomplish um, uh, in this book, is to reflect on, on those ideas to think of Butte and Anaconda as a place that people in the United States need to visit because of uh, not only the environmental devastation that's occurred here, but then because of the Superfund uh, cleanup, an amazing undertaking. And it'll never be complete because of the magnitude of that, that devastation. So this is this iconic uh, satellite view of the Berkeley pit, which inspired uh, extraction, um, the tailings ponds, the uh, east pit that's in operation today. Um, so, let's uh, take off. The introduction, here's the uh, epigram for that. It's uh, recent, not historical. The corporation is one of the most powerful institutions of our time. Corporations organize much of the world's labor and capital, shape the material form of the modern world, and are a prime mover of globalization. But corporations are also responsible for a wide range of harmful effects including the use of technologies with deleterious consequences for human health and the production of environmental hazards that threaten the planet. So I like this because the focus is on corporations. And I just want to remind a lot of us don't think about corporations much because they're, they're almost like the atmosphere, the, the air we breathe. We take them for granted in our world. But it's important to remember that unlike living, breathing human beings, corporations are artificial entities. They're created by um, uh, governments and treated under the law then as persons. Um, so if you have a normal business, there are three basic things your business does. You own the business, it's your property, you do the work in your business, and then uh, you manage your business. And one of the interesting things about large-scale corporations is that they alienate those three functions. Each of those three functions is accomplished by a different group of people. Sometimes there's a little bit of overlap, but the owners are completely different from the managers, are completely different from um, uh, the people who do the work. And in a traditional business, if I have a small business, um, I own the product of my labor. But in a corporation, the corporation owns the product of the worker's labor. So that's another feature of uh, that uh, uh, business that's been alienated. And then, this is a really key thing, owners of corporations are not liable for what the corporation does. Their only risk is what they've invested in it. So they may invest a lot of money, and if the company uh, fails, they may lose all of their money, but that's all they risk. If I have a, a business 
that has incurred some kind of liability beyond what I've invested in that business, I'm still personally responsible for that greater uh, 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 liability than the money I put into it. And so this limit on liability has been a tremendous spur to economic development in the United States throughout American history, and the same is true in other um, companies or countries that have adopted uh, the corporate form. Tremendous spur uh, for investment and economic development. So, the chapter one is on the background to mining in Butte. The epigram has nothing to do with uh, uh, mining in Butte, but I, I, I love the way Lewis Mumford, many of you are familiar with him, he was a, a prominent public intellectual uh, cultural historian. He looked at art and architecture, uh, the culture of cities, and uh, the, the role of technology in culture. And he's got a section in this book, Technics and Civilization, uh, in which he distinguishes between the technologies of farming and animal husbandry on the one hand, and um, uh, mining on the other. The farmer's tools and the machines are relatively few. As with the herdsman, his inventive capacities are expanded directly, for the most part, upon the plants themselves in their selection and breeding and perfection. But his utensils and his utilities are many. The irrigation ditch, the cellar, the storage bin, the cistern, the well, and the permanent dwelling house occupied throughout the year. Neither the peasant or farmer nor the herdsman can get rich quickly. But the rewards of mining may be sudden, and they may, be, may bear little relation, particular, particularly in the early stages of the industry, either to the technical ability of the miner or the amount of labor he has expended. Mining and refining and smithing invoke by the nature of the material dealt with the ruthlessness of modern warfare. They place a premium on brute force. In the technique of all these arts, the pounding operations are uppermost. The pickaxe, the sledgehammer, the ore crusher, the stamping machine, the steam hammer. One must either melt or break the material in order to do anything with it. The routine of the mind involves an unflinching assault upon the physical environment. Every stage of it is a magnification of power. So, uh, then, chapter two looks at the beginnings of mining in Butte, and this kind of follows on that theme I talked about. These are two wonderful quotes from the Montana Post, published in Virginia City in the 1860s, um, as uh, people started venturing out looking for other uh, um, places to strike it rich with gold, and they uh, found Butte and Silver Bow Creek. And a guy named Joe Bowers, that was his pen name, reported back to the Montana Post, Butte City is beautifully located on an eminence near the juncture of the left and right branches of Silver Bow Creek, and close to a stately grove of pine trees, beneath whose shelter has suddenly come into existence a town, comparatively small as yet, but destined ere long to be one of the most flourishing and prosperous mm. in the territory of Montana. Mm. So he, he's, you know, he thinks it's going to be prosperous because of the metals here, but what does he focus on? The fact that this is a living place and it can sustain life. But then, in contrast, we have this other report. The scenery changed rapidly. And we were soon in the heart of that celebrated formation of quartz riven rock. Once upon a time, there must have been some hot work going on, for the country looks as if it had been melted and set on end to cool. So these guys recognized, they, they're starting to understand a little bit about geological history, and uh, they were seeing um, uh, things that suggested to them, among other things, that uh, this whole place had been uh, molten at one time, and those were the kinds of technologies they wanted to use to uh, release the, uh, the, the potential for wealth that Butte offered. So chapter three, and I'll dwell on this one a little bit more, but 
launch into it with this epigram, Butte really took off in a major way in the 1880s, just remarkably, uh, the, the growth that occurred here then. And um, uh, one of the most prominent <coughs> metallurgists in the United States, taught at MIT for decades, uh, worked in the early 80s at the Parrot Smelter. And he reported on you know, the metallurgical work that was going on here. While the concentration works now in operation, as well as those in the process of erection, are by no means model establishments, they still do very good average work and are perhaps quite as well adapted to the peculiar conditions as more elaborate works. The loss of copper in the tailings is considerable. In other words, they're <clears throat> taking ore, running it through a concentrator, um, producing concentrates with elevated levels of copper, but discharging tailings that still had quite a bit of copper uh, uh, in the tailings. Um, tailings is considerable and under eastern conditions could not be tolerated, but it must be considered that in Butte, the ore is the cheapest thing we have, while fuel, labor, and machinery are extremely expensive and that the copper contained in the ore, ore bins has cost so little to mine that it does not acquire any considerable value until a certain amount of labor has been expended on it. Mm -hmm. While I do not deny that a more perfect sizing, a graded system of crushing, and a more systematic effort to concentrate the finer classes of ore might even now prove remunerative, I doubt very much if it would pay expenses to greatly extend the present system of slime treatment in which department the greatest losses of copper occur. I can, however, assert positively that at least one of the concentrating mills in the course of erection is so arranged as to carry out to a considerable extent the improvements just discussed. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, addressing this really interesting thing uh, about mining. Um, miners will uh, employ whatever technologies um, are available if they help make the operation profitable. And uh, concentrating ore is not 100% uh, effective, and so uh, they were always assaying their tailings. They knew they were uh, wasting quite a bit of copper, and with it, gold and silver. Um, but they knew that it wasn't worth the investment to try to recover more. And it's these uh, wasted sulfide minerals that were the, uh, the the reason that tailings uh, became such a, uh, an environmental hazard downstream is those tailings wash downstream. So this dynamic in uh, improving technologies contributed to the environmental consequences downstream. This uh, curve, the, the shaded area, is something I've added. Uh, but this is a, a, a nice graph showing the price of copper showing up, so where did we, here we go. Hmm. I wasn't supposed to do that. So, um, I'll just describe what, uh, what is going on. Copper uh, was really high during the Civil War, not surprisingly. And then after the war, the price of crop copper dropped down, uh, and then it continued down uh, into the 70s and continued to plummet uh, in the 80s, reaching its low point in 85, recovered a little bit. Now, usually, if the price of something goes down, that's a signal in the market to people to quit producing so much. But what happened in Butte and everywhere in the United States as the price was dropping, they kept producing more. And they did that because they, this was a period in uh, American history when people were finally figuring out the implications of the Industrial Revolution. 
and they knew how to combine uh, the tools that you can make with iron and steel, the energy available in coal, and mechanization to really uh, enhance the economies of uh, um, technological development. And so they were, uh, across this whole period in Butte, for instance, the mining companies were investing in technology and they were tremendously profitable even though the price for copper was going down. And that production, of course, continued to go up and then the, the price uh, lingered in this area afterwards. So, I'll just run through some of these wonderful uh, Sanborn fire insurance maps. Uh, the first smelter in Butte was built in 1879 out southwest of Butte, and the, the, these are 1884 images. Um, and then in 1880, the Montana Copper Company built um, a smelter north of where Meterville was along Silver Bowl Creek. Uh, 1884, W.A. Clark uh, built what was then called the Clark's Calusa smelter. In 84, it was still pretty small. and. Um, Here's the Parrot smelter, built in 1881. And by 84, it was a pretty large um, uh, operation. Here's uh, 1890, so this is the end of that decade of tremendous growth. The uh, Parrot smelter has grown much, uh, quite a bit. And this building right here is an interesting addition. The, the Parrot was the first place in the United States to use uh, the converter process, which allowed copper uh, smelters to, uh, instead of uh, shipping off copper mat, which may be 65% uh, uh, copper, they could set ship off a product uh, using converters uh, that was uh, in excess of 99% pure copper. Still needed to be refined, um, but uh, uh, made it much more profitable for Smelters. Oh, and then, then we can see here's the uh, the concentrator, and then here's uh, a tailings uh, pond being developed at the Parrot. By 1890, what had been the Montana smelter had now been bought by the Boston and Montana, probably the most profitable of the uh, mining companies in Butte at this time, more profitable than uh, Anaconda because there was so much silver in uh, the mines that uh, the B&M had. And then by that time, Clark's Calusa had been sold to the Boston and Montana as well. Both of those were up in the uh, Meterville area. And the Butte Production Works was built in 85 and had this kind of size in 1890. So Butte, in addition to being uh, a mining town, was an important smelting center. And then in uh, 1889, the Butte in Boston, related to the Boston and Montana, also built its smelter um, just, uh, just south or southwest of Meterville. So, because of all that smelting, conflict over smoke uh, arose in the 1890s. And many of you have probably, uh, you're familiar with this quote from W.A. Clark. I must say, that the ladies are very fond of this smoky city, as it is sometimes called, because there is just enough arsenic there to give them a beautiful complexion. And that is the reason that the ladies of Butte are renowned wherever they go, for their beautiful complexions. I would say it would be a great deal better for other cities in the territory if they were, had more smoke and less diphtheria and other diseases. It has been believed by all the physicians of Butte that the smoke that sometimes prevails there is a disinfectant and destroys the microbes that constitute the germs of disease. And it would be a great, a, a great advantage for other cities to have a little more smoke and business activity and less disease. So it, it was a common idea that smoke was a disinfectant. But the other thing that's interesting in this, in the late 19th century, for white people, not for other uh, uh, ethnicities and races, but for white people, it was believed then that uh, if men had uh, relatively dark uh, complexions, that meant they were healthy, but if women had very pale complexions, 
uh, that meant women were healthy. It was the understanding of medical science at the time. And it's true that if a person ingests a little bit of uh, arsenic, uh, not enough to kill you, but just ingest a little bit, it does make the complexion more pale. And so <laughs> there's a little bit of truth to this, but it's really, th this is uh, more typical of the way, especially corporations will try to, um, uh, uh, well, these days we call it gaslighting and, and provide uh, explanations for things that have nothing to do with the, the real issue. Um, so there was some pretty notorious conflict, civil disobedience, other things in view in the 1890s over smoke. And here's a few uh, photo, yeah, historical photos. This is what was Clark's Calusa and became the Boston and Montana Lower Works quite smoky. Here you can see looking uh, from uh, Big Butte, the smoke coming in from the right side is from the Colorado smelter, and then that's the Butte Reduction Works in the center, and there the smoke is drifting um, upstream on uh, Silver Bowl Creek. And in the 1890s, uh, Heinze added his uh, Montana Ore Purchasing Company smelter to the list of smelters in Butte, another smoky smelter and here's another here's the fun thing to uh, contemplate as you're um, looking at smelter photos this is coal smoke this is coal smoke mm -hmm. so all these smelters had power plants and they're burning coal but all this other smoke this white smoke is metallurgical smoke used in roasting and uh, smelting the ores driving off um, the sulfur and the arsenic into the atmosphere Chapter five, um, in the early 20th century, uh, the situation had gotten so bad uh, downstream in the Deer Lodge Valley that uh, farmers started uh, filing complaints and lawsuits. Two sets of uh, lawsuits, one concerning tailings, um, and that was tailings both from Butte and from uh, Anaconda, and then uh, the farmers also filed suit against the Anaconda Company uh, for uh, um, the, the arsenic in the smelter smoke that was settling on the vegetation, livestock would eat that vegetation and then vegetation and then they die of arsenical poisoning. And this is my favorite epigram of the, of the bunch from the Silver State. This was a weekly newspaper in Deer Lodge at the time. To show how unfair the law is in its delay in taking action against the anaconda smelter for spewing arsenical smoke across the Deer Lodge Valley. If an individual should strew poison on the ranges, as this big corporation has done, and even admits he would be lucky if he went unhung, <laughs> he would at least be speedily arrested and punished. And so uh, the, the newspaper's getting at something that's very uh, uh, perceptive here. If an individual would do something like this, that individual would be individually liable for poisoning someone else's livestock. But what do we do now with an economy that's based on corporate capitalism? How do you hold a corporation accountable for something like that? Because the, 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 the stockholders under corporate law are not liable for the harm that the corporation is doing. And so far, um, this kind of uh, activity uh, was legal. The only recourse that the farmers had was under common law, which we inherited from England, and that is if, if, uh, if uh, I am doing some activity and the consequences of my activity go across the property line onto your property, and my activity is doing harm to your property or your person, your family's uh, bodies, um, you can file suit against me under common law and either ask for damages and I'll have to pay for the damage, or um, you can ask for an injunction, ask the courts to prevent me from uh, that kind of behavior. Um, but by this time, the courts in the United States had developed a new th legal theory called the balancing doctrine. And they would look at what the harm was to the farmers and what the harm would be to the economy if the industry was shut down and they determined that the harm to the economy would be greater if the industry was shut down. So basically the farmers were without uh, recourse in this situation. 
And th this is a graph that I've uh, constructed to try to convey the scale of, of this, this damage. This is from um, a 19, uh, I think it's 1920. Um, there it is, 1913, yeah, okay. Uh, anyhow, th th this is a great uh, 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 graph. It shows, this is uh, the production of gold worldwide now. Here's copper, here's iron, this is zinc, and this is lead. And the production of gold was a little bit later, but all these other metals, the production worldwide of those metals really took off in the 1870s and 80s. And so here, this level here, and I've drawn a line across here, this is all of the copper produced in the world in 1880. This is how much copper was being produced in Butte in 1905, when these lawsuits were taking place. So copper smelting uh, produces environmental impacts wherever it happens, but all those little operations worldwide were at little out of the way places scattered around the world. If you take all of those environmental impacts from copper smelting in the world, in 1880 and concentrate them in the Deer Lodge Valley in 1905. That's the kind of environmental impact that those farmers in uh, the Deer Lodge Valley were subjected to. <clears throat> so one of those impacts, as I said, was uh, tailings. This is this great uh, photograph of the uh, tailings that were still on the site at the Parrot. Um, uh, during spring runoff and clawed burst, a lot of those tailings would wash into Silver Bow Creek, but there was still a considerable uh, tailings uh, pile there. Uh, this is the Butte Reduction Works, another source of tailings in Butte. Um, and then this is down in the Deer Lodge Valley on a, a parcel of uh, a, a farm called the Bullis Parrot Estate. Uh, the farmers down there took irrigation water out of uh, well, there they called it the Deer Lodge River, um, uh, from where it comes out of uh, Durant Canyon until it meets the Little Blackfoot. Uh, for a time, they called it the Deer Lodge River. And so tailings would flow through those irrigation ditches onto their land. And uh, that also occurred this side of uh, Durant Canyon. This is the Miles Ranch. And you can see all that light colored material is tailings that uh, during uh, spring runoff when the water level was high and those tailings would spread out onto the low lying uh, lands of the Miles Ranch. And so one of the first complaints to the smelters and concentrators in Butte was from the Miles Ranch. And uh, they complained to the Butte Reduction Works that uh, tailings from the Butte Reduction Works was damaging their property, their pasture. Um, and so the Butte Reduction Works uh, decided to try a technological fix and used molten slag to build the slag walls that we still see down there today. Um, that uh, Silver Bow Creek flows through that slag canyon and then to the west of the canyon. At one time, that was an entire impoundment of uh, uh, slag walls. And here you can see the method of construction they used. This uh, in the lower right photograph shows the the iron sheeting, um, and it's kind of like slip form construction in concrete, if any of you are familiar with that uh, form of construction. You build up one lift um, and then uh, attach the formwork and build up another lift going up. And then they ran Silver Bowl Creek through a, a culvert, and they even used uh, molten slag uh, and formwork to, to build uh, that, that culvert, which is still um, there as well. And then the other problem was smoke. Um, the Anaconda Company had been smelting at the old works um, on the north side of Warm Springs Creek uh, since 1884, and then outgrew those two upper and lower works, built a new facility which opened in 1902. And so even though those two smelters had stacks on top of the hill with flues running up to them, for some reason the Anaconda Company built this smelter. Here you can see coal smoke, and there's a little coal smoke coming out of here, but four smelting departments, all giving off metallurgical smoke. Um, the, uh, the roasting department, the reverberatory department, the blast furnace department, and the converter department. And um, in that 
smoke was arsenic uh, uh, trioxide. And arsenic is an interesting um, element because it sublimates. That means it skips, when it condenses, uh, it skips the liquid phase, goes from a gas to a solid. And so the, the gaseous, at, at high temperatures, the gaseous arsenic comes out of, and then it cools in the atmosphere and it turns into a solid, a fine dust, and it settles down on the vegetation. <clears throat> and uh, then the livestock eat it. So, uh, and then that started happening almost immediately. So in 1903, the Anaconda Company shut down the smelter, built um, that uh, giant flue running up Smelter Hill, and built a 300-foot stack. And the purpose then was to um, allow the flue dust, including arsenic dust, to settle in the flue. Mm -hmm. And then uh, anything that went up the stack would be carried aloft in, into the atmosphere and uh, not do any harm. But sometimes, under certain atmospheric conditions, um, the smoke doesn't go up into the atmosphere. Here's a photograph, and you can see the smoke is coming down uh, and spreading across the Deer Lodge Valley. And the farmers were not satisfied, and so in 1905, they filed a suit. One of the, um, there were lots of uh, symptoms that the livestock had. One of them was that horses would develop a sore in their nostrils about the size of a silver dollar. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a farmer showing uh, his horse's nostril. Uh, Fred Bliss was one of the property owners there. The suit was filed in federal court in his name. And this was a monumental lawsuit in federal court. And both sides hired experts, uh, including expert veterinarians. This is a photograph of some of the uh, um, ACM's um, experts, they were veterinary educators from some of the top universities um, in the East and one from uh, uh, McGill University in Montreal. And they uh, performed post-mortems on uh, livestock that died, they killed some that were sickly so they could perform post-mortems. And the net result was that the judge concluded that probably uh, the livestock were dying from arsenical poisoning but the judge was more persuaded by the Anaconda Company's argument that <clears throat> it couldn't afford to do anything more. If uh, the court required the company to do more, they'd have to close the smelter. Um, closing the smelter would mean the mines in Butte would close, and Butte and Anaconda were the market for all the farmers' produce. And so the harm of uh, closing the smelter would be greater than the harm that the smoke was doing. So, Nothing more happened on the smoke front. <clears throat> so this is the time then of this great corporate consolidation. Uh, in chapter six, <clears throat> I, I chronicle how this uh, worked. You, most of you are probably familiar with um, the amalgamated copper company, and that was a, a, a trust, a holding company. Um, all of those companies, uh, the Anaconda Company, the Washoe, uh, the Parrot, the Colorado, the Butte in Boston, the Boston and Montana, uh, they still existed as corporations and they were the operating companies. And then finally, in uh, 1910, all of those companies deeded their property to the, to the Anaconda Company, as did W.A. Clark, and in 1906, I think it is, uh, Anaconda also got Heinze's property. So in 1910, the Anaconda Company became the owner and operator of virtually all of the uh, mining properties, milling properties, smelting properties in Butte for copper, not for zinc um, or later for manganese. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and then Anaconda started building this global enterprise as well. So this is uh, from a, uh, an economic historian writing uh, in 1927, the years of 1895 to 1901, Inclusive were, in certain respects, among the most spectacular that the American copper industry has ever known. In this period, the same tendency was manifest in that industry as in other American industries. The tendency of large corporations and groups of capitalists to come into control of more and more units of industry. So, the Anaconda Company was following that trajectory uh, exactly and continuing on into the 1920s. 
So, the um, farmers in the Deer Lodge Valley asked the U.S. Department of Agriculture to send scientists out to study um, the, the, the problem <coughs> that they were uh, faced with. And while they were out here, these scientists also looked at the National Forest properties um, in the Deer Lodge National Forest, south of Anaconda, west of Anaconda. And they found that there was <clears throat> a tremendous amount of uh, dead timber in the forest that was being killed by smelter smoke. Um, and so uh, the United States filed uh, suit against um, the, the Anaconda Company in 1910. They reached an agreement in 1911 um, whereby the United States would put the suit on hold if the Anaconda Company would agree to pay for research conducted by a three-man board of experts. They came to be called the Anaconda Smelter Smoke Commission. Um, <clears throat> they would study the problem and then look for technological solutions to the problem. And any uh, recommendation that the Smoke Commission made, Anaconda agreed that it would implement. Now, one of the terms of the uh, uh, agreement was that recommendations had to be practicable. Practicable. That would mean that uh, it was technically feasible and the Anaconda Company could still be profitable while employing it. Um, so, um, that gets at that economic argument again. So here's John D. Ryan, president of the Anaconda Company, addressing the uh, graduating class at uh, Missouri School of Mines in 1916. If the Anaconda Company should do all the good things its engineers recommended, it would never pay a dividend. They are good engineers, and most of the projects they urge are good. But if we carried out all of them, or our, our capital would be perpetually tied up. So, you know, this gets at this thing. Um, you, can, you can, if you're just thinking of efficiency, for instance, you can keep investing more and more money in uh, uh, doing something more efficiently, but um, if you're measuring it in dollars, it's, at a certain point, you're uh, getting less of a benefit than, um, than the cost uh, of, of that additional uh, uh, that you're investing in that additional um, <clears throat> um, uh, improvement in the technology. And what uh, Ryan is arguing here is that uh, we'll do a certain number of things, but we won't do anything that prevents us uh, from being uh, profitable. Oh, and I should add, <laughs> this is a parenthetical, I wasn't thinking of uh, um, inserting this, but one of my colleagues at Michigan Tech wrote a wonderful book about 20 years ago called Redefining efficiency, and the focus of that book was on the oil industry, and uh, that, that became a major industry around the turn of the 20th century. And as the scale of that industry increased, more and more oil was leaking into rivers and harbors and causing all kinds of havoc and polluting things. And there, there was a, a, an outcry that there had to be some kind of law passed uh, regulating uh, the oil industry. And the engineers argued, uh, wait a minute, we're a new industry. We recognize that this stuff is getting uh, leaked into harbors and stuff like that. But from the company's point of view, this represents waste. And it's in our interest and in the company's interest for us as engineers to figure out how to prevent that waste. Because if we do, then that's more money in the pocket of the oil company. So just give us a little bit of time, and we'll figure out how to make more money for the companies, and that, in turn, will solve your pollution problems. And that um, engineering argument prevailed until um, a little bit in the 1920s, but basically not until the second half of the 20th century. And people recognized that as the oil industry grew in magnitude, the amount of oil being leaked into the environment uh, was increasing even though the percentage of production might have been declining. And so it wasn't until uh, about 1970 that the United States and the states realized that they had to start regulating the oil industry. And so then engineers had a new challenge. Instead of trying to figure out 
how to prevent waste so that the oil companies could be more profitable. They had to figure out how their companies could meet those environmental regulations and still be profitable. And they figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so we, we, we live in that uh, uh, regula uh, regulatory regime now where companies figure out how to be profitable even as they're meeting these strict environmental standards. So here's a photograph that the Forest Service took of dead lodgepole pine in the Deer Lodge National Forest in 1907. <clears throat> and uh, so the, the um, Smoke Commission recommended finally at the end of the decade that the Anaconda Company should build a 585 foot tall stack, and that's the one we have with us today, and put at the base of those stacks Cottrell electric, electrostatic precipitators. And so they used static electricity on big uh, sheets uh, in those structures that you, you can see the, the structural steel at the base of the stack. Um, and, and that enhanced the ability of the system to uh, recover flu dust. And this could be profitable for the Anaconda Company because there had developed a market for arsenic uh, used as a pesticide in cotton fields and things like that. So the Anaconda Company could make uh, money um, uh, off this investment. They needed the taller stack to provide enough draft to pull the, uh, the smoke through the treaters and the flu, and you can see the old 300-foot stack uh, next to it. <clears throat> and here's some smelter workers in the flu uh, cleaning out flu mm -hmm. dust, which is uh, rich in arsenic, and uh, they didn't quite have the protective gear that uh, people would expect these days. <clears throat> so that um, new technology did a pretty good job of removing arsenic from the smelter smoke. Not enough to meet uh, the environmental regulations of the 70s, but for the time, did a pretty good job of removing arsenic. But they couldn't figure out any way that would be profitable for the Anaconda Company to remove SO2, uh, the, the sulfur that was being given off from the ore uh, during the roasting and smelting processes. And so a cool thing happened in 1922. Congress passed uh, a Land Exchange Act. Many of you are familiar with the fact that um, uh, railroads coming across the West um, were given uh, land grants in a checkerboard pattern, um, X number of miles on either side of the right-of-way. And, uh, and that was uh, earlier in the 19th century. And then when the national forests were set aside in the 1890s, that left a lot of national forests having to manage uh, public lands that were in that checkerboard pattern as well. And so the Land Exchange Act uh, was intended to allow the Forest Service to exchange lands with private property owners to consolidate the national forests, making it easier to manage national forests. And Fred Morrill, who was uh, the district ranger for the uh, Deer Lodge National Forest, thought that it would be a good idea to use that new act to swap all that forest land that had a timber killed on it, now by smelter smoke, with um, the Anaconda Company for good forest lands elsewhere. And the Anaconda Company by that time had a lot of forest land in western Montana because it had bought a lot of that checkerboard uh, forest land from the Northern Pacific Railroad, which received uh, one of those big land grants. And so he proposed this idea. The Forest Service cannot but be concerned with the continued and increasing damage caused by the smelter fumes in the Anaconda region. The exchange idea suggested seems to point a way to solving the matter to the mutual satisfaction of both the company and the government. And so across the 20s and 30s, um, the Anaconda Company and the Forest Service negotiated uh, six land exchanges and more than 100,000 acres of formerly Forest Service land with uh, dead timber on it got put in the Anaconda Company's hands and the Forest Service got um, uh, the, the same amount of uh, acreage of healthy forest land elsewhere in western Montana. So with that, 
Now the Anaconda Company, because of those farmers' lawsuits, the Anaconda Company had easements on uh, most of the uh, property in the Deer Lodge Valley, and so it was free to uh, pollute the Deer Lodge Valley. It owned the land that was south and west of the smelter and a little bit north of Anaconda, so it was free to pollute that land. Um, and uh, so by the 1930s, there weren't very many people complaining anymore about the pollution that the Anaconda Company uh, was causing from its smelter. And so the, uh, that ends the, the basic part of my uh, history, but I have a chapter nine, which is the epilogue, to bring us up to date. And so to launch that chapter, I have a quote from uh, this two-part um, uh, article in Fortune Magazine, which is about Butte and Anaconda. Um, a Arriving in Butte, a visitor would find man who has already been gutting the hill for two generations, still blasting his way farther into hotter and wetter depths, helmeted against the rock itself, naked against its heat, drenched with the sweat of his body and of the earth's. Sometimes, but more rarely now, thanks to elaborate ventilation, the heat will touch 120 degrees, this is the nightmarish place of business of some 5,000 of the Butte miners who, for a base pay of $5.25 $5 an hour, spend eight hours a day probing its darkness with the cyclopean lights on their heads, pushing the labyrinth further and further still with electric drill and dynamite. The city of Anaconda is related to Butte, but resembles it not at all where it reaches skyward with the world's tallest stack, from which the gases of the smelter are vented 585 feet into the Montana sky. Here, Butte's ore passes monotonously and almost silently over miles of conveyors, where great magnets automatically pluck from it the nails and the tools and the drills the miners have dropped in the fever of their toil, where stage by patient stage the rock is crushed and screened and ground to sand and wet into green-brown mud and siphoned into the monster vats to settle and then bubbled restlessly in the flotation process where what is mainly copper quietly declares its affinity for the pine oil and forsakes its native rock, rock mud which goes into the creation of a new mountain of sludgy waste. Then the dehydrated coppery slime goes through, the, through fire to be roasted and into the hellish gas-burning reverberatory furnace for, a more, for more of its dross to be burned away and thence to the converters to boil until a pygmy man standing up at the hissing nozzle mouth of the converter furnace 30 feet above him decides by the color of its flame that the brew is ready to pour. And finally, daintily spilled by 10-ton ladles into a fourth furnace, the copper spits forth at last the molten essence of Butte's priceless hill to harden its, in its mold into a blistered square of metal that retains as it cools the iridescence of the fire that made it. So, you know, uh, people, journalists have uh, tried to uh, capture in words the uh, um, environment of Butte and Anaconda for decades, and this is a, a great example of that. And unfortunately, because of the way Fortune magazine works, this writer is anonymous. Uh, but in that article, there's this great map called the United States of Anaconda. You can see the giant geographical area of this uh, global enterprise now. Here's uh, Montana, of course, uh, but then uh, there was this wholly owned subsidiary, International Smelting and Refining, that had smelters in Tuella, Utah, and uh, Globe, Arizona, and then international owned mines uh, in other parts of the West to feed um, the smelter. Here's Green Cananea, a subsidiary of Anaconda in Mexico. Anaconda owned lead and copper uh, smelting and refining fab, uh, plants and then uh, wire and rod fabricating plants in the Midwest and uh, East. Um, and then uh, we've got uh, South America, Chuquicamata and Puerto Rios and Chile. 
and Anaconda even uh, for a while in the 20th century had uh, a mine in uh, Poland. So quite the global uh, enterprise and things were just moving along swimmingly for Anaconda for a couple of decades there, including not having to worry about people complaining about its impacts on the environment. So uh, that, they still did have some problems with tailings. These are the four sections in chapter uh, nine. Um, and then I described in summary form uh, what happened since World War II and especially um, uh, Anaconda's loss of its uh, Chilean properties um, uh, being bought by ARCO at the end of the 70s and then Superfund comes to town and I provide a summary overview of the, uh, well, the creation of CERCLA, uh, the law, and uh, the, 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 the steps that have been completed in remediation in Butte and Anaconda, um, uh, something like $1.6 billion uh, spent so far on remediation and some of that work is going to have to be done uh, um, in perpetuity, uh, in, like uh, treating the, uh, um, the water from the Berkeley pit. And so that describes um, uh, this huge uh, uh, environmental slow moving catastrophe that happened and then an effort uh, to make the environment whole again. And it's in that context that I close the book talking about Butte and Anaconda, which are uh, a, a large National Historic Landmark District. And we oftentimes, well, yeah, here's a nice map of the uh, uh, Clark Fork, uh, the, the, the three different uh, Superfund sites comprising this complex. Um, uh, here's a photo of uh, what uh, the streamside tailings looked like uh, Silver Bowl Creek is approaching uh, Durant Canyon in the background there, and that's all been cleaned up. Um, and then here we have the Berkeley Pit, this uh, uh, giant body of contaminated water, which last I checked is the most visited site for tourists in Butte. And with, with good reason, with good reason, one, one, two good reasons. One is uh, that there's this idea a historian of technology named David Dye talks about the technological sublime. Um, for a long time, people thought of the sublime uh, as uh, spectacular uh, 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 places in nature like Grand Canyon. But as uh, the world has industrialized, people have started to think about uh, certain kinds of technological uh, uh, features as sublime as well. And, uh, Part of the sublime is that it, it, its immensity is so great that it inspires awe, and awe has as part of it some fear. When you see Grand Canyon, it's frightening the first time. It was for me, anyhow. And, um, and so the atomic bomb is a great example of the, the fear that uh, that uh, uh, can instill. And, and I think people uh, uh, look at the Berkeley Pit um, and just see that big hole in the ground, and then the more they learn about that water, um, that is um, an awesome sight. And uh, artists have been drawn to it. Uh, many people in this room know Christy Hager. Uh, she painted uh, this painting of uh, the Berkeley Pit. Um, this is the kind of painting that you see in that uh, series of uh, exhibitions and extraction. And I'll point to one other really cool exhibition, the, the Phoenix Art Museum uh, in November of last year mounted an exhibition called uh, Landscapes of Extraction, um, Mining in the American West, the Art of Mining in the American West. And it's just a gorgeous array of paintings depicting this kind of scene. You know, this is, uh, looks like abstract art, and artists recognize that, and the public recognizes that. But then there's also an opportunity to inform the public about the environmental consequences that derive from this, and the work that has been done uh, to uh, try to clean it up. And so, um, uh, when uh, um, I had, uh, I worked at RTI, um, and Mary was working at RTI then, and we got uh, uh, some uh, grant money to develop 
uh, this uh, Butte Anaconda Historical Park System Master Plan. And then ARCO funded a similar planning effort in the, the 90s uh, called the Historic Preservation, the Regional Historic Preservation Plan. And in, in our plan, uh, we proposed that there could be seven major historical interpretive themes. And the seventh was uh, environmental degradation and reclamation. And I still think that, uh, and thinking back to that uh, quote that I gave you from Ed Dobb at the beginning of this talk tonight, uh, this is maybe the most important contribution that the historic cultural sites in Butte and Anaconda can make to the nation, is to be able to come here and learn about this stuff. Um, and it's in, in, in the vein of this marvelous book that I commend to you. Uh, Melinda and I, in uh, fall, in November of 2019, uh, took a two-week road trip through the Deep South to visit sites associated with the Civil Rights Movement. And we began the tour by visiting two historic uh, uh, plantations in Louisiana. And we got to see slave quarters as well as the Grand House. And while we're driving, we love to read out loud to each other in the car. So on that trip, we read to each other this book. Susan Nyman is an American. She was born in Atlanta. She's Jewish. She's a philosopher. And she's lived for several decades now in Berlin. And she is absolutely uh, taken with the way that the German people have worked through the fact that the Nazi era is part of their history. They can't just sweep that under the rug. And so they have, by and large, done an amazing job of figuring out how to talk about this. And her book is about uh, uh, ways that people in the American South are uh, trying to do the same thing, to figure out how can we talk about the fact that slavery is part of our history, that the Jim Crow era and lynchings are part of our history. And we have to be able to do that. And it's in that vein that I think that we need to be able to talk responsibly about the environmental contamination that mining caused in Butte, and then the ways that people are trying to restore the environment in Butte and Anaconda. And so, you know, we've got these great landmarks that everybody uh, knows about, um, but some of them have uh, uh, kind of uh, um, not cheery aspects to them. The Granite Mountain uh, head frame, where um, the, the worst hard rock mining disaster in uh, um, U.S. history. Um, here's the, uh, the stack. It's a state monument now set aside um, as a monument to the generations of smelter workers. But it's also a monument to this really complex history of that smelter causing all of that damage to the livelihoods of the farmers and ranchers in the Deer Lodge Valley and the Anaconda Company and the federal government trying to get involved in finding uh, some res resolution to that problem. We've got the Old Works Golf Course. Underneath that golf course <coughs> is a huge bed of really toxic uh, tailings. And so this is a, a really interesting uh, story in the creation of that problem and uh, an attempt at an innovative uh, uh, um, approach to uh, trying to resolve it. And the cool thing about this site, uh, right at the bottom of that photograph out of the site, are, are the ruins of, uh, it, it, from this vantage point, the upper works. Um, the, the ruins of that old 1884 smelter are still there. You can look down on those ruins from the walking path. The Warm Springs Ponds built in 1918, Ponds 1 and 2, uh, by the uh, Anaconda Company as a way to collect tailings from Butte. By that time, Anaconda owned all the tailings in Butte, um, as well as the tailings in Anaconda. And so to try to um, uh, uh, allow those uh, tailings, those solids, to settle before the Clark Fork continues uh, downstream, um, and then added uh, Pond 3 in, I think it might have been, 57 or something like that. Um, and then, uh, under Superfund, this whole uh, complex of ponds has been uh, enhanced to serve the Superfund uh, purposes 
And so this is a great uh, interpretive opportunity, um, as well as being a popular hiking spot, place for bird watching, for fishing, uh, that kind of thing. And I understand there's a lot of discussion going on now about whether to retain these, but I think uh, these are really valuable for interpreting the cultural history of Butte and Anaconda. And then, uh, uh, this is the last image I'll show you, this uh, um, Slag Canyon. And in the background, you can see a part of the slag walls. This is the last feature <laughs> in Butte that represents that milling and smelting history that was so important to Butte. There's lots of remnants of the mining industry, but this is all that's left of that other feature of the, um, uh, the, the overall uh, mining industry, which is milling and smelting. And it's there because people were complaining about tailings getting washed downstream. And this can tell a really powerful uh, story as well. So that is it. Thanks for your attention. Whoa.